<laughs> we'll be right back with William S. Buckley. Stay where you are. My next guest is the uh, founder and editor of the National Review, noted column and a columnist, and of course, uh, hosts his own show called The Firing Line. He's written a new book called Who's On First? And it's an intriguing spy uh, novel that's centered around the U.S.-Soviet satellite race of the mid-1950s. Would you welcome William F. Buckley, Jr. <laughs> ¿Y cómo está usted? ¿Cómo está? Muy bien. Ah, pues me, me parece que usted uh, quiere que yo, se, yo hable en español para de, darle oportunidad de desayorar su promesa de hacer un simul broadcast. Pero... Sí, es la, la chiste. Es la, es la chiste. Es la chiste. Sí, es la chiste. Es un joke. Ok, folks, that's it for here. <laughs> yes, I knew you, uh, you handled a little Spanish here and there. This is kind of an extension. You are on kind of an uh, intriguing spy uh, thing. The last book was Stained Glass, and yeah, the ones well, before was The Queen. Uh, 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 saving the Queen. Yeah. It's a little bit intriguing uh, nowadays in, in the spy literature to, uh, to uh, bring out a book in which uh, the American spies are actually to be distinguished from their guys right. in the sense that uh, not that we do different things, but that we are serving a, a better cause. In the, in the last 10 or 15 years, has been a tendency, I think regrettable, to assume that um, if you push an old lady and somebody else, is, somebody else pushes an old lady, that which is similar between you and that other person is that you both push old ladies. Not whether you're pushing the old lady away from the way of a bus, and the other fellow's pushing the old lady in the way, in the way of the bus. bus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I attempt in, in this novel, without uh, surrendering the, the ambiguities, to, um, to make that distinction, that we're fighting on, on, on the right side, which has been, as you know, a terribly unfashionable thing to say. Although, as we know, uh, Mr. Carter has now uh, suffering from an inordinate fear of communism. Yeah, that's it. We could, well, let's touch on that a little bit. I was watching a show the other night, I think Washington Week in Review, and they were discussing the situation in Afghanistan, and somebody had asked if he thought he had overreacted, and I think it was the former um, ambassador to, to Russia who said he thought he might have, but it was an election year, and not that he thought it was a good idea that the Russians moved into Afghanistan, but somebody pointed out that the United States also now is very friendly with China, which doesn't seem to be a bad trade-off. One billion people for uh, 17 or 18 million. But that is really never brought up. Well, it seems to me uh, an overreaction to Afghanistan would be defined uh, as a reaction that caused the Soviet army to move out of Afghanistan and also Eastern Europe. That is to say, you then overreacted in the sense that you got more than uh, the status quo ante. But, uh, but as long as the Soviet Union continues to occupy Afghanistan, we are worse off than, than we were before. What really, what really happened, uh, uh, and your <coughs> stories of the, of the uh, calendar change are in a mysterious way obliquely relevant, uh, is that uh, we, we have been proceeding on the assumption that the expansionary phase of the Soviet Union terminated with the consolidation of uh, their hold over Eastern Europe, and we have found out that, in fact, it, uh, uh, it didn't. There's no question that uh, in playing the, the, the China card, we're simply picking up uh, strategical weapons where they lie, even as we picked up uh, Stalin as a common ally uh, against uh, Hitler. But, you know, there's, there's, there's yeah. been a lot of self-delusion and uh, the question really is, can, can you write uh, uh, a novel that works its way into the interstices of the problem in such a way as to bring people a sense of adventure, a sense of the moral ambiguities right. of the quarrel, while still maintaining that essential equilibrium, which is that the Gregorian calendar change works in a particular way. Right. I, had a, I, had a, I, had a, I had a classmate who... Uh, 
a, a classmate, a, a guy of enormous uh, presumption, we, uh, we always sort of uh, were in awe of him when we matriculated as freshmen because he not only was married but remarried. And uh, this is an unusual accomplishment in a freshman. But uh, uh, in, his, in his sophomore year, he arrived back at school a week late. So he was called in by the dean, because in those days, deans called in people who were refractory. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, uh, Mr. Hadley, how is it that you arrived a week late? He said, well, sir, I spent the entire summer uh, in a study of the Middle Ages, and I was so absorbed that I forgot about the Gregorian calendar change. <laughs> So the dean looked at him and said, in that case, Mr. Hadley, you would have arrived back a week early. <laughs> it's, that, uh, it's that historical equilibrium that one needs to hang on to, which is that although a lot of people uh, sting other people and a lot of people go in for espionage and a lot of people penetrate other organizations, whatever you say about the United States, we are still making some kind of an effort to keep a few people free. You'd last... <laughs> 10 seconds in the Soviet society. And uh, it, makes the, the to, it makes a difference yeah. to uh, a lot of us that you have lasted uh, 15 years. Well, you can say it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you too, I might add. Thank you. How do you feel? Are you tired of talking about whether the United States attempt, the Carter administration's attempt to cancel, boycott, or move the Olympics is a good weapon to use? <clears throat> Uh, uh, it, it is impossible, I think, to uh, superordinate any single consideration over the dominant consideration. Uh, E.M. Foster wrote a lot of interesting books and said one really dumb thing. Uh, his dumb thing was, uh, I hope that if somebody were to give me the alternative of uh, voting for my friends or for my country, I would vote for my friends. Well, in the first place, the probability is that even his friends were uh, members of his own country. Now, in an age in which we are seriously considering drafting uh, women, uh, the notion that we can't ask uh, people who throw discuses to join us in a common enterprise is, I think, recognized by the American people as intuitively incorrect. And I think it is remarkable that people who have made as many sacrifices as this, these Olympic uh, athletes have made, uh, remarkable that the majority of them appear to be in favor of, of yeah, boycotting they do, the they? Moscow Olympics. Yeah. It would probably be uh, a very difficult thing for the, uh, for the Russian leaders to explain to the people, the Russian people, would it not? Because most of the Russian people probably are really not aware of what is going down yet. Yeah. If it comes to... Uh, down to the, uh, the bottom line on this thing, then th they're going to be in a little bit of trouble to explain exactly why this took place. Well, the, the, the Russian leaders don't specialize in explaining things to the people, but... but sooner or later, it is, when, when it gets no. down to why they're not there, no, it, they'll it, have to come it, up it with is, something, won't they? It, it is true. It is true that they specialize uh, in the idea of legitimacy. And uh, one of the reasons why, for instance, if you travel to Leningrad, the one place that they won't show you is the palace occupied by their immediate predecessors, is that uh, it is easy to go from Peter the Great and Catherine on over to Lenin, but it's a little bit more difficult uh, to go from Nicholas II uh, to Lenin, in as much as there was a guy called Kerensky in between. He was all about democracy, and all of a sudden we had uh, uh, Lenin. Now, this being the case, a challenge to the legitimacy of the Soviet state is posed in terms of symbols. And the fact that they were intending to act as the accredited host of the civilized and to be sure uncivilized countries of the world uh, gave them a sense of well-being and a sense of the consolidation of their effort that Helsinki went a long way in giving them. To take that right. from them is something that is very nearly unendurable, which is one of the reasons why they are really hurting right now. It seems that President Carter is, uh, as the columnists refer to it, is having a Rose Garden strategy now, and Mr. Kennedy is trying to get him into some kind of debate. Do you think that's a crucial thing that the American people are somewhere along the line going to ask for? And uh, if it does happen, does it? Television apparently has had a tremendous impact, at least in the past few years, on the perception of a candidate by the, by the public. 
and they would like to see that kind of a debate. Well, I, th I think uh, Mr. Kennedy's invitation to uh, debate with Mr. Carter is the um, a single most staggeringly uh, hubristic uh, 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 act of the, of the century when, uh, when, uh, when T.S. Eliot uh, sent to Ezra Pound the book by Dr. Williams, uh, he wrote back and said, this must be the most inarticulate man who ever gargled. <laughs> Uh, and anybody who, anybody who transcribes what Mr. <coughs> Kennedy uh, has said during the past uh, seven or eight weeks must wonder what on earth he would say uh, in, in a situation... In a situation in which he actually had to try... One well, thing time, about you, Bill, you're certainly able to hold a hydra partisanship here. <laughs> Disguised. Uh, now, now, wait a minute. It was on this program, <laughs> on this program, that uh, three years ago, that I said the conservatives were very open-minded people. We weren't going to criticize President Carter, who had just been inaugurated, until he screwed up, and we didn't. <laughs> That's right. You were fair there. You did wait, didn't you? Uh, uh, a modicum of time. Um, it took a few months. Do you think... Uh, what, <laughs> if you had to make a, a, a calculated uh, guess... Did you see Mr. Carter getting the nomination and against who for the Republicans? Well, I think that uh, anybody who makes a calculated guess in public without the following reservation is dumber than I am. And that is that the statistics show that anybody who does make a bet, these are statistics that go back to 1946, has a 70% chance of being wrong.